Welcome, everyone, to the John Topovich Show. How's Woo! it going? Woo! <laughs> uh, I am your host, John Meisberg, and today my guest is Eugene Kappen. Yeah, you said it right. <laughs> Kappen. Uh, he is a social media futurist, public speaker, and new media artist. So um, thanks for being on the show, hey, Eugene. It's my pleasure. Appreciate it. Um, I have met him uh, at several virtual reality events around the city. He is um, one of the people to know in that uh, area. Um, and I'm just really excited to be able to talk to him today. This is going to be great. Uh, he's worked with companies such as Microsoft, Skype, Wizards of the Coast, and more. Um, and so I think it would be pretty cool to talk to you about uh, some of the creations that you've worked uh, worked on through your studio, Studio uh, Capin. Do you think you could uh, share some of the the things that you've worked on? No, oh, absolutely. Uh, do you have a, a pull-up? Yeah. <clears throat> so, let's see. Um, what should I what should I start uh, with? StudioCapin.com. Studio. <clears throat> Cool. Yeah. So Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. What? Yeah. So uh, Studio Capin is a XR content creation and animation studio. Mm -hmm. We actually founded the company because we had sold one of the first in VR talk shows to ever be ordered as if it was a TV show. Oh wow! Uh, it was glitched. It ran for three seasons. Uh, it was me, my show partner, and our manager at the time, Tavis Hamilton who is now uh, our lead business development guy at Studio Cap'n. And we... So this is you. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's a digital version of me. That okay. is my wait, avatar. Wait, I gotta see those. How, so how did you create a digital avatar of yourself? Uh, so when we sold the show, Topher Welsh and I flew down to California and we got what's called a duplication scan. Which is just a fancy word for uh, photogrammetry. Model. Okay. So there's some kind of crazy machine with the cameras everywhere. That's right. Okay. So, kind of like how they they do a bullet time in the Matrix? Actually, like, yeah. Kind of? Yeah. So basically you get into this booth and you have probably 50 to 100 cameras that all take a single photo of you mm -hmm. all at once. And then a team somewhere else takes all those photos, creates a point mesh model system mm. of your body. And then two weeks later, they send you a FBX model wow. of you. And it's all high res and detailed. And, and now, we... now I kind of wish I had lost some weight prior to... <laughs> like, that gut is never going to go away. That is forever etched into my avatar. Uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah, how accurate are these models? Are they like very accurate? Pretty or? accurate, <laughs> unfortunately. So it's not like when you create like a Nintendo uh, me character and you can kind of embellish like what you want to look like. It's like no, it's an no, accurate no, that capture. That is me. That is okay. Me, my terrible five o'clock shadow. <laughs> oh, I, I think it's okay. But so, so then you bring in this this graphic file into into your show and then when you move or it moves it responds to whatever you do yeah it's it's a virtual so, version of you yeah so we did the first season in Altspace, which is owned by microsoft and Altspace was a well is a platform that is just it's all encompassed it's it's all there once you log in you get some very easy styles to like pick for facial features mm -hmm. and body types and everything like that. But high fidelity is a lot more customizable. So what is high fidelity? It's like a uh, competitor. Yeah. So did you ever play second life back in the day? Um, I studied it from like an academic perspective, but okay. I didn't actually okay. participate. So the same people that made second life made high fidelity. Okay. Uh, Philip Rosedale and his team, uh, basically went, Hey, this thing that we wanted with second life, VR is now a thing, so why don't we just create a new version of it for people who actually want to do things in virtual reality? And I believe now they're just a meeting platform versus like a, a social platform like it was before. Hmm. 
yeah, I think they they just took a shift. But Interesting. So you're you had the first, you had the first, first show to first ever be picked up as if it was a TV show, as if it was a TV show in VR. Yes, and ran for three seasons. That's a that's a pretty great accomplishment. I know that's nobody. Awesome. Yeah, we got an IMDb credit for <laughs> it. Nobody can take that away from us. That's awesome. Like I, I do like to preface that. We were not the first, like, in VR talk show ever. Okay. Uh, there was the Foo Show, uh, which was the number one cloud or, um, like, user-backed, like, like on a, what was it? Not Patreon. It was uh, one of those, like, sites that you raise money on. Oh, GoFundMe? Like, it was like Go- Kickstarter. It was like Kickstarter, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a, a show called Gunther's Universe. Um, that was way ahead of its time. And then even before that, he had another show. The guy who runs Gunther's Universe had a show that was all about politics. Okay. That they performed in VR. Mm -hmm. And it was just this garage indie startup where he was like doing everything from his van. So one of the things I wanted to ask you around this topic is uh, when it comes to like creating a show in VR, like what are some of the considerations that you have to take in? You have to think about that are different from creating a show in like physical reality. Oh man. I guess creating the digital avatar. So so instead of like location scouting, Mm -hmm. uh, you can just go and create your location. If if you're a 3d modeler or or you have those skills. So you can be like, um, I want to have an interview at the grand Canyon and you just go build the grand Canyon. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. that's, That's cool. Okay. Actually, with uh, with our first season on Alt Space, we uh, we stole Reggie Watts' stage. Oh, you took his uh, background or yeah. modeled it off of it? No, no, no. Uh, so when we when we got picked up by Alt Space, mm-hmm. um, we weren't purchased as a season yet. It was all experimental content. And basically, when I jumped into VR, I started following everybody I possibly could inside of the industry, and one of the people I found to follow had just been hired at Altspace to help put together like 16 big shows on their platform. And some of those shows were like Reggie Watts, Justin Roiland, who created this show called Rick and Morty. Oh yeah. Uh, I've never heard of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we were just talking about it. All right. Um, Sarah Silverman, Michael, Sarah, Tim and Eric had, okay. a, had yeah. a channel called uh, Josh. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of great comedians got involved very early. It's yeah. awesome. And then somehow I got <laughs> a meeting. <laughs> wow. uh, I, I think he just like saw that I was following went, oh, you have a verified, you know, Twitter account. You've obviously been doing YouTube stuff mm-hmm. at, at a very high level. I was coming out of working at a YouTube consulting agency called Press Play right after college. And he was like, you know what? You probably would be a really good fit for this. And clearly I was Mm -hmm. (laughs) because once Altspace went under financially before Microsoft bought them out, uh, we had, you know, eight episodes of this like in development experimental show that was very much ahead of its time. And then High Fidelity was like, hey, we like your show. Yeah. Which kind of was like, oh, what about everybody else? Oh, we're the low hanging fruit. (laughs) You you could probably afford us versus like trying to pay Reggie Watts to produce a show or something, right? I do think that something that you said that this is very forward thinking and ahead of its time is, I think that's true. Like this is incredible technology that I think is just being underutilized or under experienced by people because like maybe it's just like it hasn't scaled as much as it it's capable. Like VR mm. hasn't scaled as much as it's capable of scaling, but like like maybe like. Do you think that like maybe in the in the in the near future shows like this will be like the standard or become more I, more incorporated in like oh like when my family when they turn on YouTube TV and they go to they're like what channel do I want to watch like they're not thinking what VR channel do I want to watch but I think maybe that is going to change So there's definitely some comparisons that we can talk about right now um and YouTube in itself has uh, over 2 billion users a month, mm-hmm. right? And the entry-level way to virtual reality, or considered for the most part the entryway, is 360 video, which YouTube does. Mm-hmm. So already you have over 2 billion people who have access to VR, just probably not a VR headset to experience it. So they're experiencing it in 
dimensionality reduced content, which is just taking something that's in VR, condensing it down to a 360 video, condensing it down to mm-hmm. a 2D view screen. Right? Yeah. And and that's fine. But if we're going to talk about like getting closer to the metaverse, yeah. where that's I think where you're where you're talking about, it's it's going to take some time. Uh, I, there, there's like a lot of hurdles we have to get through right now. Well, I see like some people that experience these 360 videos literally by just um, taking their finger on their phone or using their mouse to just like move around mm-hmm. and be like, oh, I can move this thing. But that's how they're experiencing it. Like they're yeah. not truly experiencing it the way it's supposed to be experienced, which is putting on a headset and like being there, feeling yeah. like you're there. Like I think more people need to experience I'm, that. I'm waiting for YouTube to basically pick up like um, interactive null points inside of their 360 videos so they can like press something and then jump to a different 360 video. Okay. Like hyperlinks in the yeah, video. Yeah, basically that's what it would be. Okay. Um, YouTube back in the day used to have gamification a little bit in terms of people would do like story modes and Is... then be like, if you think mm. Ryan should open door one like that. Or, or pick up his girlfriend's cell phone, you know, press this video. Like that episode would... of Black Mirror. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where they did like a choose your adventure. Oh, uh, the... Bander Snatch. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly like that. Okay uh youtube did it first yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then before that it was rl stein or the simpsons right yeah <laughs> wow so yeah and so youtube is helping to uh bring some of this technology uh to become more mainstream uh i guess so is sony with the psvr i guess because a lot of people have playstations mm-hmm. in their home and so maybe a uh a playstation a psvr is one of the more like seamless ways for them to get into a vr experience because they already have a place what does a psvr cost right now um you know uh can we look it up really quick yeah we can hold on i know we're kind of deviating away from the original question of like show me all your cool shit <laughs> but <laughs> okay. so, so it looks like uh a psvr is 299 Starts at two ninety nine, so that that is um that's the same price as the Quest Two, right? Yeah. Which is Oculus's newest. You might as well just go and get a you know an all in one VR headset, right? Yeah, for so that for, price. So I'm. This is this is the one that I was just reading up on, which is like you don't need you don't need a computer to use. Let's see. You don't need a computer for this headset. It's all inclusive. Like the computer is in the headset, but you have the option to link it to a computer to get better graphics or something. Mm-hmm. Is that is that how you would describe it? That's exactly how it, I okay. would describe it. Okay. And yeah, it's, it starts at 300. So you think uh, a Quest 2 might be a better option for like a an introduction? I, I think it really depends on... Because I, you know, PlayStation is going to have you know unique content that's going to be separate from mm-hmm. you know any VR headset, any exclusives. Yeah, yeah, any any sort of gaming device is always going to be having you know different sets of content. Yeah. Uh, with an Oculus, though, you basically have um, access to their entire store. You know, all the Facebook stuff coming out. And then if you really want to get into it, I know there are some hackable ways to get VR content from Steam onto it. Mm-hmm. Kinda, so kind of like, yeah, kind of like, uh, like, re- like revive back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there's so many, that's some, that's one of the things that was kind of complicated for me when I was doing research for this uh, episode is that the last time I looked at VR headsets, there were only like a few viable options, and now it looks like there's like five or six different like decent headsets and out there. And every I, year, it's going to get upgraded. Yeah, and it's like as a consumer, I would probably, if I didn't know that much, I'd be like, which one should I get? And we don't have to get into this now, but I've just like it's. I think more more work needs to be done so that the consumer doesn't have to think, and they can just be like, this is off. Like when. When a, when a Nintendo Switch comes out, everyone's like, "That's what." Obviously, you get you get, got to get the Nintendo Switch. And it's yeah. like, okay, you get it. <laughs> it's like there's no thought. I think like the more VR can get to something like that, or it's like this is the thing, get the thing. I'm like, okay, you're waiting for the uh, the killer app. 
Yeah. Is basically what's happening. And then you're identifying which headset the killer app is actually yeah. on. Don't make me think. Just let me have the, tell me this is the, the thing to get and all the kids want to do this thing and then I'm good. I, I really think it comes down to what do you want to use VR for? Uh huh. If so, like, uh, my roommate lost 60 pounds playing VR. Was it uh, Beat Saber? No, no, no. It was, um, <laughs> it was Pavlov, I think. What's that? Oh, it's like a shooting game. Oh, let me look that up. Pavlov. Pavlov VR. Like the dog? Yeah. Here we go. Let's see. Okay. Looks a little bit like Counter-Strike. Yeah, but the difference between this and Counter-Strike, if you want to crouch, you have in to counter, crouch. you actually have to crouch, right? Versus mm. like pressing a key. So apparently he was doing like 500 squats a night. <laughs> playing this game interesting i wonder if there's here, here we go let's see an example a oh, good old pewdiepie here we go oh going through the walls <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you're you get way more into it when you're um in vr you're, you bend down to bend down you yeah, I, your your body is the controller. Yeah, I played some kind of zombie shooting game like this in VR, but I forget what it was called. And I, and I remember afterwards feeling like I got in somewhat of a workout. But I've seen some people that have uh, said that uh, they, they do a lot of audio shield or Beat Saber, and they mm -hmm. they said that's a decent workout too. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. No, he he upgraded to uh to Beat Saber, and that's how he works out. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to lose weight, get a VR headset. Because <laughs> it encourages you to move. You know, it's kind of like I personally am a big fan of Dance Dance Revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's a game that I can get really into. And then, you know, 30 minutes, an hour goes by. And I'm like, wow, I just burned a thousand calories. And I was having a lot of fun. And I wasn't even thinking about the workout. Whereas, like, if you go for a run around your block, you know, the whole time I'm just like, I hate this. <laughs> well, where you're just like in your head and you're like, man, this sucks. Yeah, it, it's just not very distracting. And so I think it's nice to be able to have like, if you're doing a VR experience that takes your mind off of the, the work involved of exercise and you're having a lot of fun, then maybe you're, you'll be more likely to, to do it and make it a habit and mm -hmm. do it over and over again. That's cool. Um, Tell me about, tell me about uh, Mario. This Mario thing. I think the people that are watching the stream have to see this because I I saw this and I was like, how did I how did I miss this? I didn't... <laughs> Actually, I think I saw this come out a long time ago when it when it first came out, and I didn't know you made it. I didn't know oh. that this was you. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is amazing. So like nine million people have seen this. Yeah, that's really that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, and they I think more people should see it. It's, so. So this is a a three sixty video. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, this is the three sixty uh, recreation of the very first level of Super Mario for the NES. So this is like super nostalgic for all of us thirty something year olds that got this when it first came out. I so there's so I was watching this talk by uh, Cinosaurus mm -hmm. at After Effects Seattle, and they talked about how do you make a video go viral. That's and cool. <laughs> it, what I'm all yours. Let's hear yeah. this. <laughs> I need to know this. So there's basically like four different elements to okay. to making a video go viral. Okay, One is notes. timing. Okay. Which is like so say like the Oscars are coming up, right? Yeah. Uh, if you start making Oscars content right before the Oscars, people are going to start tuning in because they get excited for the specific event that happens every single year, mm -hmm. and because you know that it's coming up, that's called flagpole content. Because you're like, there it is, let's go make it, and it's probably going to do better than a lot of my other videos. The second thing is, um, it would be fandom, right? How many people already like it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, so if you're into Star Wars or Mario or Disney, there are huge fandoms that people are like, that looks amazing. I want to watch that because that has piqued my interest. Like, you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You're trying to capitalize something that has already been built, which is great. Uh, the third thing is um, quality. So it actually has to be good. 
Like you're not just making content and then using a really good thumbnail or a really good title because if those things are great, people click into the video and then they can't understand your audio or the lighting is terrible or it's a wonky composition as far as like your camera placement. Yeah. They're going to turn off right away. Yeah. You're going to lose that watch time yeah. and no one's going to want to watch your video. It isn't part of that. Um, isn't part of how that works is people assume like if there's something wrong with the quality of what they're looking at, then they probably, they don't really trust that anything else is going to be right. It's kind of like how um, musicians would do this thing. I forget what, there was a band that did this thing where like they would put in their contract to only have like green M&Ms in the studio. And if they showed up to the studio before a show and there was other colors in the bowl other than the green M&Ms, they knew that they didn't follow the instructions for all the other things that they wanted to happen uh before their show so it's like it was an indicator that like it's not going to be good so like maybe like we we make these uh assumptions that are like oh if somebody has a misspelling here or the lighting's wrong or the audio sounds bad that like the rest of it probably won't be good <laughs> i i think writers for uh for artists is just nothing more than a power play oh um, okay <laughs> but that's, that's the theory but, i've heard that's a really good theory though <laughs> Uh, and then the fourth thing would be... Sorry uh, for the tangent. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> then the fourth thing in the quadrant would be um, marketing. Like actually spending the time to take your video, put it into places. So like if you're capitalizing on fandom, you're probably going to go into a bunch of Facebook and Reddit groups and post that video there. Yes. Because it's related to the people that you know mm -hmm. are actually part of those groups. Sure. And maybe encourage them to share it in some way or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, if, you, if you're about like food, you might join a a Facebook group called uh, Bon Appetit. Bon Appetit. <laughs> bon Appetit. Uh, well, you've definitely accomplished your uh, viral marketing campaign because, you know, you're, you're close to 10 million views on this video. So congratulations. Thank you. It's, and it's very well deserved. This is a really interesting um, experience. I'd love to try to experience this in with a headset on so I could like look around and you know put on I could have a Mario hat upstairs I could put on and just kind of like <laughs> pretend I Get am him really into it just like uh lower my lower the back of my pants a little bit so I can have a plumber butt crack <laughs> 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 this is really cool all right nice. oh, I, uh, I tried to produce one of these um so we just got this major sponsorship from a company called Puget Systems okay and they hooked us up with an eleven thousand dollar render PC. Wow! So I'm trying to get a video like this out every thirty to uh, forty five days. Okay. How long? How long does something like this take to render? Uh, like a month. <laughs> a a month for a minute long clip. Uh, under like three minutes. Yeah. Oh my god. Well, here here's the thing. So we like, um, when we did the Pac Man video, uh huh, it was taking. Uh, on our computers, probably 18 minutes a frame. With the render PC, it was taking about 37 seconds a frame. Whoa. So whereas it took us six months to render it out, this right here. it would have taken about four days on the Super PC. And then we could have moved on. We could have got into the next thing. This is like a haunted circus. Yeah, I took... Uh... <laughs> oh, shit! <laughs> Yeah, I took Pac-Man's level and turned it into a haunted house, and you're trying to get around all the ghosts, put it out for Halloween. Oh, fun. Or intended to put it out for Halloween, and then rendering took forever. I, Yeah, I'm hoping that like in the future they can figure out how to um, give us the ability to render... Uh, VR experiences in a shorter amount of time it probably allow for content creators to you know create more when you're the bottleneck is the the to, the processing time involved you know and the cost involved you, know, you say it costs what eleven thousand dollars for, for a render PC for a render PC you know if you could, get it down there well it's kind of like think about 3d printers how like the price drops so substantially and now like I have tons of friends that have them and I think it's like it allows more people to get involved and try take a shot at like making their own stuff mm -hmm. i think price and uh the the speed to these machines can create these experiences i think will 
all help with the industry growing. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I'm also looking into like uh, real time animation. Okay. Uh, I, I think that's going to help with everything. So I'm looking into like Unreal and what it would take to actually produce 360 animated films through Unreal. The Unreal Engine. Yeah. Which is, that is, um, it's, it's like. It's, it's a game engine. A game engine. But it has yeah. um, a bunch of cinema tools now. Okay. So they've been working on adding like, did you ever see the un- the newest Unreal demo? Mm-mm. Should I pull it up? Oh my gosh. It's, it's amazing. Um, en- uh, is it Engine 5? I think yeah, so. I think 5. so. 4. Wait, wait, is this for Tomb Raider? No, it wasn't for Tomb Raider. Is this for like it a looks demo? like it looks like Tomb it was Raider. very Tomb Raider esque. I did see this actually, but I'll show it anyway. I, I didn't know it was Unreal. Yeah, I saw this because uh, I was researching the PS5 and trying, and they were like, "This is what the graphics can look like on a PS5," and they were trying to show like how many triangles there are and. I was like, wow, that's yeah, the a lot of triangles. Point clouds <laughs> for their models and stuff and getting those very uh realistic PBR textures in there. It just looks amazing. Yeah, I know. It looks so real. I feel so spoiled. <laughs> like the kids growing up right now are so spoiled. They have no idea like how bad we had it. <laughs> they're never they're never gonna know. They're just gonna be like, this is just how it is. I but like this isn't this is like video games. To a whole nother level. I actually didn't have a game system until I was 18. Really? Yeah. What was your first game system? Uh, I bought a used PS2. Okay. Oh, I'm... Yeah. B- both my parents are doctors, and they were like, you need to go to med school. And uh-huh. I was like, I want to be a YouTuber, and my That's... mom like cried for three days. <laughs> what they should have done <laughs> is like rewarded studying with video game time. That's what my... My parents were like, okay, you can... You can have you can play this game for an hour if you do X. Like they used it as like the carrot kind yeah. of thing. But but now parents are like, no, you need to play your video games a lot because <laughs> that kid made three million dollars <laughs> playing Fortnite. I know, and some of these kids that are making these little like video, uh, they're making kid content on YouTube TV, and they're like mm-hmm. making millions of dollars from all these little videos, like showing toys and. It's it's a weird world we live in now. Where like I think it's fantastic. I mean, it's great, <laughs> but it's like it definitely has like proven to the previous generations that they're wrong about how you can create value in society. Is you, you can you don't just have to be a doctor or a lawyer. You can be a content creator that helps people experience new things, and and there is value in that, and that the market will reward that if if you can do it in a in a, a way that's uh, unique to to what people see. I guess. I don't know. I, I think that's where my whole mission to try to get like the metaverse up and running and people doing things inside of like So, so wait, we... what what do you mean by the metaverse? I don't know what that means. Oh, okay. So um the metaverse is the eventual replacement of the internet. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> this is news to me. Okay. Okay, so like this is the whole thing about like the VR industry. Okay. Um we're trying to be like, did you ever see the movie Ready Player One? Um I really have wanted to, but I have not. And a lot of people told me I would really like it, but I think you, the gist of it is I think, that I think you would love it. The gist of what I've heard is that like people they put on the VR headset, but they also have like the body suit where like everything they can experience all the the senses, right? Mm-hmm. But it's more than that. Uh, yeah. So basically, in in the movie, you have one central video game world, okay, that is all interconnected with smaller worlds within it. Hmm. And in Ready Player One, it was called the Oasis. Okay. In the real world, in Meat Space, with you and me, we call that the Metaverse. Okay. And basically, we're working right now to get virtual reality to a level where it functions as if you were on the internet. Hmm. So you would put on your VR headset, your gloves, your haptic uh, suit, Mm -hmm. and then you would go to the library. No, I wouldn't go to the library. <laughs> well, I mean, Even, but, I would, I, I'd probably or, check or, or Facebook. Like, <laughs> or like the VR version of the library, right? Uh-huh. Where you show up, you go to a kiosk, you ask for a book, and 10,000 versions of that book shows up. And mm-hmm. then you're like, I want the level version. Okay. And then you can load it around you almost like a holodeck. Oh. Huh. So it's just basically like, it's like our world, a virtual world that's layered on top of this world. Is like what the 
the meta metaverse uh so so when we talk about xr as a whole or, or extended reality uh we break it up into a couple of different categories okay virtual reality is when you are visually and ba- basically you have a virtual version of the world that you've been teleported into if you want an overlay of the entire world around you while you interact with it, that's augmented reality. I have a graphic we can show for this. Something like that. Yep. That's perfect. So with augmented reality, it's you're taking in visual and auditory and GPS location information, and then you're having some sort of visual or auditory or some sort sort of sense manipulation like uh like it. like pokemon go yeah where you can see the po- like the pikachu over your toilet or on the, in the yard and you're like oh throw the ball and you, it's like a mix of the two yeah now it's a now it's ar but when it first launched it was like it was fake vr or ar okay it, it wasn't real it was using the gyroscope in your phone versus okay. actually tying to the information that your camera was reading oh, okay uh, they fixed that since. But what I'm really waiting for is called Lord of the Ring View. Lord of the Ring View? Yeah. What's that? It's where you put contacts in, and then it reads all the information around you, huh. and then it overlays basically graphics that match one-to-one to make it look like you're in Lord of the Rings. Oh, like a, like a user interface or something. No, user interface. no, so so like instead of this being a white table, I would look at it and it would be like solid wood with engravings and stuff. And and these, it, w- it would look absolutely real to us. But these would be things that you would decide on a computer somewhere and then you could program it? Or like why would it change to be Well, that? it would automatically do it. It would pick up the visual information that you would see within your lenses mm-hmm. and then it would automatically change it. But... It's so changing would... it based on what though, like decisions that you've made. No, no, no. It, so or... you would run a program. Okay, okay. That so makes you would sense. have a program that basically goes: this is a table, this is a chair, this is a computer screen, mm-hmm. this is a keyboard. These are cameras, and yeah. then change it to whatever that world would be. So how far off are we from that kind of technology? Not in our <sighs> lifetime. Twenty years. <laughs> oh, in our lifetime, yeah. you think? Twenty wow. years. Okay. Cool. Yeah, uh, I'm waiting for like six G to become a thing. Mm. So with 5G, we're looking at I don't know, 100 gigs a second, maybe, of information being passed in. Okay. Um, 6G standards haven't been set, but I think I, but I did the math one time for an estimation, mm-hmm. and I got like 32 terabytes a second of oh my information. God. And at that point, it looks very real. Hmm. Yeah. So. Our internet is just very primitive at this point, and it's also dwarfed compared to other countries like South Korea. Like they, we have Estonia. Like, <laughs> yeah, like well, like we have like the, like the way they sell internet in America is like based on like, you know, they try to charge you for faster speeds. But it seems like in other countries, it's just like no, like we want everyone to have well, yeah, like, the a... fastest speed possible because then it's like the infrastructure that supports all of the th- cool things that we want to sell you while you're using it. And it's just like a different, man- different philosophy for how we use the internet. Yeah, here. capitalism and neoliberalism has completely <laughs> failed us in that department. It's really a shame because you know you want to make America great again. I think just give us the fastest internet possible for everyone. That would be a g- great start. Right. I think. Make it a utility. It should be a utility. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I mean, some people I mean, say like you don't need it to survive, but I feel like, you know, if you take the internet away from me, I feel like very disconnected from my world. And that almost feels to me more important than like electricity. Like, I don't know. Like I, if I had to choose, I might. <laughs> I guess you need electricity for the internet. But like, if I had to choose, I mean, internet's pretty high well, up there for me. Well, technically it's arguable that you don't need electricity right what do you but mean? so like um humans got by for you know thousands and thousands of years without electricity oh, right i just meant so to technically power the we, internet. Don't, we don't need it to live correct but we figured but we decided to classify it as a utility because it makes everybody's life better mm-hmm. right and so the same thought process should be applied to the internet i agree yeah i agree 
I was just saying that you need electricity in order for your modem and your router to even turn on to get the internet or oh. your phone to be charged to con like things like that. But it's all kind of like interconnected in that way. But anyway, this is really interesting. So, um, contacts. Yeah, I want some of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else can you show me? Um, anything you wanna, else you want to talk pull about? Up? You want to talk about Pexels? So is this this is there is some this kind is of um, stock photography? You so I think you you mentioned it to me earlier. There's some there's some uh, pictures that you took. Uh, wearing v a VR headset, so, yeah. So, and, um, and apparently these these photos got used way more than you expected, and I, in ways you did not expect, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. So, about that. Um, my my ex girlfriend and I, uh, well, yeah, we went to the Commotion Labs at the University of Washington when it was open, and we took. This a bunch great. of purposely bad stock <laughs> photography. What do you mean purposefully bad? This like, is great. Like, like I, I, gotta, I, I, I didn't think anybody would use this. Eugene, you got to own it. Okay, this is a great photo. <laughs> <laughs> they were meant to be a lot worse. Oh, okay. But anyway, so I put this package together. I put it out there for free, and <laughs> Hiya. it's just, it's, it's in like twenty five thousand websites uh -huh. and blogs and like i had to stop counting like other stock photography sites stole my photos mm -hmm. to repost on their own site and so i couldn't even track like how they were being used anymore i mean in some ways that's a compliment i mean you created it's... something that everyone wants to use i mean that's yeah. nice and it's like i guess there isn't a lot of vr stock photography to use in the first place so they're just like let's just take what's what someone else has made they probably owe you some money for that, though, right? Well, no, I put them out for free because oh, okay. I was like, "Hey, you okay. know, have at it." I should have. Um, well, I think I think several people have like tipped me for, okay. for them before. Well, now you're the guy. Maybe maybe I, round two of your stock photography, you can uh, you charge can for put it on Getty Images or something and try to make some money. <laughs> Be like, "Hey, I'm, I'm the guy now." Yeah. Yeah. So I unintentionally became like the face of virtual reality to some degree. And it's, I don't understand this one though. Like, why would you be? <laughs> that, no, that was my point. Okay. Like, like that's part of the joke. <laughs> I think we could take this a step further and even find create some more scenarios that are just like ridiculous. Like, here's a good one: driving a car, <laughs> uh, driving a car, riding a horse, flying a plane, shopping, <laughs> anything that you could kill somebody doing, pretty much. Shooting a gun. <laughs> yeah, yes. 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 <laughs> Round two. Round two is going to happen at some point. Or maybe like throwing a baby in the air. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe just a baby doll. Like do, something that do looks you got like a, a baby, baby I can borrow? I do, but I think I might get in trouble letting you use it for that reason. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're almost there. Just a little bit down. Yeah. You know what? It's interesting. And I was, sidebar, I was doing some research for this episode and I saw someone has created something for the HTC Vive that tracks your tongue. I'm sure you're aware of this, but uh, let, let me see if Wait, I can pull what? this up. Tongue. I saw it on Reddit, and I was like, what the hell? Oh, it, lip lip tracking. Here we go. Wait. Look at this. This little, like, adapter thing. What? I know. So, like, if you had something like that, I guess you really could drink a cup of coffee, and it would, like, show up in, in VR. I wonder, like, what would be the purpose oh, of that? I... I think this is more for like facial capture uh -huh. for doing animation. Oh, or like having a virtual avatar. Yeah. Which is another topic that, that I wanted to talk to you about. Topic. Yeah. So there's a, there's a famous YouTuber that goes by the name of Pokimane. Pokimane? Pokimane. Main. Yeah. Yeah. P O K I M A N E. So it's this girl on YouTube. She's pretty popular, a uh, streamer, gamer. And she uh, introduced something that it, it, she's not the first person to do this, right? It's like no, it's, no. it's been we, going on for a while. We were doing it in 2016. Yeah. So uh, she's just, um, you know, she's just one of the more um, like famous, famous people that have said, hey, you know, I'm going to try this out and and in front of everyone. And it's gotten a lot of attention. I think this happened maybe like a week or two ago. I think I have it somewhere already pulled up, too. Let's see. 
or maybe don't. I don't even understand how this became like a controversy. <laughs> so it's a it's a controversy. Why is it a controversy? I, I think a lot of her fans just assumed that she wouldn't be on camera anymore. Oh, like and this, and is this it. would be and like she was like, "Hey, I don't want to be me anymore. I just want to be a cute anime girl." Mm. And so this is yeah. it. This is so this is you know, maybe we should first show what she looks like. So here's here's the girl. Here's the girl. And so yeah, she has a pretty popular ga- uh stream for gaming. And then so this is her uh VTuber. So V two this since we're like uh virtual Virtual YouTubing. Yeah. But you could use it outside of YouTube. Like you could do this on Twitch. Would that what would that be called? Virtual twitching i i would, I would just <laughs> call it vtubing still because they own it it's kind of like podcast is from the ipod but everyone uses the term now exactly yeah so this is her character her virtual character um what do you think about this eugene i think she's owning it i think it's cool that she's doing it i don't understand why it became such an issue to so many people because mm. this is not a new thing this, I was, is, this has been done for a long time, and there are several programs you can download for either free or like 15 bucks or something. So are you saying that I could easily do something like this uh, for like an episode of my podcast to like 100%. for this show and just put a virtual version of me right here and and uh, yeah, huh? That'd be fun to try. I mean, you can go get a duplication scan if you really want it to be realistic, uh-huh. does, or you can hire a, a three D Blue, Blue Cross. Modeler. What? Sorry, I was gonna say, does Blue Cross like cover that? Is that covered under insurance? I, I don't think so. <laughs> it sounds like a procedure that it would be covered. Though. <laughs> anyway, um, I was reading an article about virtual tubing, and somebody was saying, this woman was saying, "Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty uh popular streamer, but the times that I don't go on camera, I get about twenty percent less people tuning in. So if I'm just if I just do audio and just show the game that I'm playing without." me on camera with like with my makeup done and the lighting like 20 like 20 percent less people tune in for this girl and she's like the the concept of being a v a, a, a vtuber is that i can on the days that i don't really feel like getting all done up for my stream i can just put on my virtual tuber uh, avatar and talk and talk and it's like it lets you have a day where you don't have to be physically present i thought that was kind of interesting but I, then i, I think guess from a mental health perspective that's great yeah to give them a break i so in the youtube world burnout is a hundred percent real and there there are creators who basically get rid of everything else in their life except for trying to make video content and that's because the entry level for um being a professional youtuber is so incredibly high because there's so much competition or what is well, it no because uh well that and adsense is so low so if you take a look oh, at so you need a lot of views you're saying to make any money yeah so if you look at like the top if you go to the very top three percent of professional youtubers mm-hmm. and you go to the very bottom of that three mm-hmm. percent the average youtuber at that level is only making seventeen thousand dollars a year and that's a, if they're doing it full time yeah wow that's that's poverty it's pretty low yeah it's like food stamp uh salary yeah yeah so when people decide to be a professional youtuber what they really need to do is have some sort of business associated with whatever they're doing Mm -hmm. they need to know how to do brand sponsorships they need to know how to sell courses they need to know how to like produce merch they need to figure out how how do you make money to support you being a YouTuber. Yeah, basically. so it's kind of like the music industry, right? Like musicians have pretty much just given up on making money off of the music itself, but they've mm-hmm. found like um, ways around around their music to make money off of the the merch or the concert sales or other things that they appearances or I don't know. Well, what... Yeah, because nobody buys albums anymore, right? So but it's almost like the music has become the advertising the me- for for the other things they can sell you. Yeah. I guess. So uh there's a artist by the name of MC Lars mm-hmm. who 
put out this song that basically talks about how this entire shift happened where we were selling records and then MTV happened, right? And then MTV became the promotional device to push uh, tapes and CDs. And then Napster happened. Ooh, and Na- then Napster is a, a big, big contributor Lime, to yeah, this. Yeah. LimeWire, Napster, you know, any yeah. sort of torrent site. Yeah. And then people, all these artists are like, oh man, how do I how do I make a living if everybody is downloading my music? Mm-hmm. But on the other side, if you were not a famous artist, and this was the best way for people to discover your art, to discover yeah. your your content, because say you were you know you were a rock band, right? And you might have a song that sounds very much like it, so you knew that everybody who liked to say Metallica would like your music, but no one's ever heard of you. You might sneak it into the database of like downloadable content, label it as Metallica music, and then let people download it for free. And then just put a disclaimer at the end, be like, Hey, this wasn't Metallica. This is actually the band, blah, blah, blah. You know, you should check us out on, you know, MySpace. (laughs) Yeah. So it, it, it was definitely more helpful to the up and comers, but I can say I've spent thousands of dollars on, going to shows and music festivals just to see artists that honestly I didn't pay for their music um, initially, but I would have never even heard of them if I hadn't have acquired the music that way. Like they've just, it would have never, it would have never happened. Are, would... are you buying their music or are you streaming their music? Well, I mean like initially back when Napster and LimeWire were a thing, you know, okay. just like everyone else, like I was downloading everything illegally and listening to all these artists that I never heard of. And that turned me on to wanting to go see them live, right? And so, like, I supported them probably ten times more through the merch and the and the concert sales. Um, like, you know, I think I'm thinking back to being a teenager. I remember listening to like the 30 second samples on iTunes, the (laughs) iTunes store, and being like, "Oh, I gotta like that." And it's like, even just getting. I just think that music slowly became more of like an advertisement for like, do you like to to building a fan base Mm -hmm. and. I don't know how transferable that is to to VR, but um, I I think it's I think it's incredibly transferable. Yeah. Uh. So like demo demo games or what? No, no, no. So like, we basically took a product and we turned it into a service. Okay. So what's to stop us from taking VR as a product, turning it into to a service? Right. Mm-hmm. So you might you know go to a, a virtual reality concert. But, you know, there's ads everywhere. And that's how the shows are being paid for. Uh, or you might, you know, go the product route where it's, hey, I'm going to pay to download, um, say, Cookie Monsters, you know, independent uh, music experience where I can download it. I can go into it in VR. Uh, there's a whole performance done, kind of like uh, Travis Scott in Fortnite would done visually uh and then with me buying the experience i get his album for free oh yeah that's a creative way to go about it yeah okay that's actually something my uh my studio is looking at doing right now uh we just hired a cto and we're working on music venue vr platforms interesting you know what you should <laughs> Um, so, so do, do you create totally new, um, venues from scratch or are they modeled off of places that already exist like Red Rocks or like, the no, 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 we Theater? would, we would get very much more like astral plane. Uh, okay. <laughs> I actually think that maybe you should also consider recreating a few of like the really popular spots in America, because I think that there would be, um, the novelty of getting to attend your favorite music venue in a virtual space, especially during COVID where we can't use them. I think there's a huge market for that. So like the two, the two biggest uh, music venues in, at least in the Northwest area of, of the States uh, that I know of is like the Gorge Amphitheater, which is where Paradiso and a lot of other music festivals mm-hmm. have happened. And this whole year it's been canceled. You can't go to any of them, yeah. but like it's, most it's like going to the grand canyon and having a stage at the end it's like of the before you fall off the cliff it's just like a beautiful place or then like red rocks over in colorado it's just like these are beautiful venues that i think like 
if you could attend them like a virtual version of them and then have mm-hmm. artists perform there i think that some i think in some ways that would probably be more popular than a totally new it, virtual it place it would it would make sense for say if paradiso had a vr experience like then we might go that route okay. but if we're doing a, a concert experience with an individual artist mm-hmm. we're going to build those stages and those assets and to basically match the persona of the artist okay now you know it's, you know this is this is great like relative to what we're talking about right now um one of the things that i came across when i was looking up um the uh what is it alt vr uh what was it called um I forgot. Alt space, alt space, right? So like this year, Burning Man didn't happen. And so all the people that usually would go to Burning Man, a lot of them, they recreated what it's like to go to Burning Man. Um, and they met, they met. I I thought they did it in the wave. What do you mean? Oh, there's another experience called uh, the wave. Well, maybe they deviated and there's two different, oh, two different um, options. But, the playa, I guess, where everyone meets. They like a lot of these like sets were recreated, and the people they they chain, you know, they dress up the way they were dressed, and they had a lot of workshops and concerts. And I missed this completely. I would have loved to attend this, but I didn't get to didn't get to go. But um, so what's the the wave? Uh, the wave is a VR music experience. Uh, mm. so like a lot of really big, uh, performances have been done, including like Lindsey Sterling, Sterling, The Weeknd, uh, no. Oh, there's others. that multiverse term. Yeah. Huh. Meta- metaverse? metaverse? Metaverse. Oh yeah. Anyway, I just was connecting the dots and it sounded kind of similar, but, um, something else that I was uh that caught my eye when i was looking through your your website was the a 360 experience you did being in outer space can we oh can you talk about what, uh journey vr about that? yeah uh journey vr was my very first 360 animated experience ever okay and i was just diving into vr it's a, it's incredible can i just say it's incredible this is the first thing that you did like it it oh, definitely looks like it should have been one of the more recent things. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, so basically what had happened was I jumped into the VR industry. I quit my job as an art director. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I already had a technical background in motion graphics and some 3D. And I was I got into a conversation with a event called Seattle Fashion Week. And they were like, hey, we really want VR or 360 video to be part of our offering for when people come to the show. I was like, that's great. When is it? They said, it's in 30 days. So you have 28 days to get an experience together. I was like, wow, that is not a lot of time. I'm not sure what I can put together. And so I, every single day for like 12 hours, I was working to get Journey VR put together. So how, how much time did you put into this? A lot more than I care to mention. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this was an entire month of work for this how about ni- nine minute experience. Nine minute experience. Uh, how long did it take to render? 70 to 90 hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. And th- this wasn't done in like C4D. This was straight out of After Effects. Oh, okay. And, I was... and that's where I saw it because I went to one of the After Effects meetup meetups in in Fremont. I think at the Adobe building, and I think I saw a demo of this like a while back, and I was like, "Wow, that's so cool!" It was probably when I first uh, released it to everybody mm-hmm. because because the day that it got released um, on Steam was the same day that um, I was demoing it at the Adobe building in Fremont uh, for After Effects Seattle. And 
I did everything myself except uh, the music that was done by Adrian Ladelia. Of okay. Classy skeleton time. Now I hate to break it to you, but I feel like you are missing something. There, I don't see any aliens, so I'm kind of disappointed that. I mean, what can you get in 28 <laughs> days? <laughs> I want to Ma- see a maybe little you UFO are, go by. Maybe you are the alien. Yeah. I just, yeah. But the evolution for like the release for this is kind of interesting because. I did it for Seattle Fashion Week, and then people from SIF saw it, the Seattle International Film Festival, Mm. and they were doing their first uh, 360 video and VR segment at the festival, and they were like, hey, you should submit this. So I did, and it became an official selection for SIF. Oh, that's awesome. And then somebody at Steam saw it and was like, hey, uh, we're doing a 360 video rental program on steam. Uh, We're trying to get artists and experiences put together. You should, you should put this on there. And I did. And it was the number one 360 video rental for 30 days. That's awesome. Right. So I think something that is standing out to me as you tell me about the process of how this was discovered is that you never know exactly how one thing is going to lead to another you just have to like make sure you put your content content out there and like and be open to like saying yes to new experiences and new opportunities like you started off like here you put out this thing and then like one person sees it and then it gets shared by another group and then another like it's just like like but you didn't see the end goal in mind oh, of like how it was going to develop oh, of course not yeah no so uh this and this is true for you know any field um do as many things as possible Mm -hmm. fail fast yeah learn from your failures pivot and then go again i think i saw something on your instagram or twitter or some picture that said like um make a hundred bad posts before you ask for a follower is that kind of similar to what you're saying right now yeah yeah (laughs) it's like Uh, make like fail fast like make a lot of mistakes so that like you can learn from them and so any professional youtuber um whenever people are like i want to be a professional youtuber what do i do how do i gain followers and i'm Mm -hmm. like make a hundred videos of you just learning the process before asking for a single follower Mm -hmm. and they'll be like that's too much work i'm like then you don't have it in you to be a youtuber (laughs) i'm sorry yeah like the average the average youtube channel with a thousand followers has a hundred videos but you get these kids who are, you know, see David Dobrik and PewDiePie and Mr. Beast, and they fail to understand, like, those channels, those people, were content creators for a very long time before they became PewDiePie. It didn't happen Mr. overnight. Right? No, so, like, the first, like, seven years of the Mr. Beast channel, he had, like, 2,000 subscribers. Yeah, Like, nobody watched him. And then he finally started to gain traction. Uh, Daryl Leaves in the Night Company got a hold of him and was like, hey, we're starting this company. We really think you're going to blow up. And then that's when he became Mr. Beast. If you look at the eventual progression for PewDiePie before he became PewDiePie, there was a long time where he was doing horror games and very few people were watching him. It was a slow progression. But so anytime, you know, people tell me I want to be a professional YouTuber, I tell them it's a 10 year journey before you get anywhere. Wow. And you have to be okay with that. Yeah. And I think maybe people get into it. They are not really expecting it to be that work. It's all fun and games and just money and fame and lots of people paying attention to them. No, no. It's it's you wondering how you're going to be able to pay your bills some month. Yeah. It's, you know, how do I, you know, work with everybody? How do I continuously create content as, like, a vlogger through COVID? I mean, reality gets in the way of your goals, but those who are really meant to be able to do it at a high level for a long time, those are the people who stick with it. So, we've talked about... um, Things that you worked on in the past. Why don't you tell me about, like, some of the projects you're working on now? Sure. Uh, So uh, Studio Cap'n is a content, XR content and animation studio. 
So we take clients who need like explainer videos or 360 videos. Um, we just got into the music space. We released a digital show package for an artist by the name of Trip Street, which was a lot of fun to work on. Uh, and we just hired a CTO um, at the company and her and I have been actively trying to build a VR music platform. Oh, wow. So, and we're getting to a place where we're going to be able to start showing people what we've been working on. Okay. When do you, when do you think something like that's going to launch? <sighs> Give us a month. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's in. Yeah. So it's, it's all about like creating those demos, creating those prototypes, and then getting people with the money into place so we can fund making the rest of it. Mm. So it, it takes a lot of money and time to develop VR platforms. That's the truth of it, because it's, it's a video game. Video games are really expensive to make. And when you're trying to solve a problem, such as how do you perform as a music artist in, you know, with COVID, when nobody can be within six feet of each other, everybody has to wear masks, People aren't spending money to go to shows anymore because of it. How do you fix those problems? Yeah. Well, this is kind of our solution to that problem. I th I think it's something that it's very much needed at this time because, you know, people are getting really antsy and they're starting to do renegades, which is they're just doing it anyway. And I think that's contributing to the, the spread of COVID. People just saying, I don't care anymore. I'm just going to do it because you can't can't stay cooped up for this long so mm -hmm. i think the more the more opportunities there are available for people to um for people to get out there and uh get that at least even if it's in a virtual arena just to be able to get out there i think you know you're providing something that's really valuable to society so that's mm -hmm. that's great um what about um what other projects can you tell me about uh Everything else is That's under the... NDA. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, I, I kind of expected that. I kind of expected that um, it would be kind of difficult for you to share things that are like up and coming. But yeah. But it's exciting that like you've got a lot of things I, in the works. I so. got a Flappy Bird 360 video that should be launching in the next week. <laughs> Flappy Bird. So that's the game that. That is the game that. Um, Everybody was addicted to for like a summer. Three it, years ago, it, it was so addict. It was so addictive that it had the guy, the creator, took it off the iTunes, the Apple Store because yeah, he was he week. felt <laughs> he felt bad about it, right? Yeah, didn't he make like a quarter million dollars or something? And then he was like, "Oh my god, this is too good. This is too addictive. Yeah, I gotta take it down." Yeah, and then people were selling their cell phones with it on there for tens of thousands of dollars. Oh my god. I mean, that's what kids are doing right now with uh, Fortnite, right? What are they doing? Oh, because of the, the Apple lawsuit? Um, because Apple and Fortnite are going through, like, lawsuit legal battles. So the um, basically Fortnite is taken off of the, the iTunes store, right? Um, yes, because they were, tr they were trying to, like, monetize inside of the app and the, and Apple wants them to monetize outside of the app? Is it something like that? I, I, I think it was Fortnite basically going, hey, um, you know, you could download Fortnite or you could use this roundabout way and dr download it directly from the website. Mm -hmm. That way we don't have to pay 30% to Apple. Mm. So... So it's just fighting over money is basically it, what's it going is. on. It is. Yeah. But Fortnite had the best rebuttal ever. They So there's this very famous Apple commercial from the 80s. And it's – everybody is basically sitting down. It's just – it's very Orwellian. And somebody runs up and throws, like, a TV or a computer or something – through this giant monitor of a talking head mm -hmm. and it takes everybody out of this like trance that they're in. It's like Apple. And it, it's basically talking about how Apple is the new thing that's taking down the corporate giants. Like it's cool to be part of Apple. Mm -hmm. And then Apple is now so big that they like become the thing they hate. Well, 
that that's basically what they were um, saying it to. But Fortnite made a parody version of that with their own characters, taking down Apple as if they were the big bad authority. Mm. And I'm just like, man, that's that's too perfect. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So we've talked about you know think projects that you've worked on, and um, I was interested from your. You have a lot of experience with VR. I was just thought it'd be fun to talk to you about like what are some of your favorite VR experiences that uh, were not something that you made yourself. Like, what would you recommend to somebody out there that ha- doesn't have a lot of experience with VR? Like, what what say uh, they get a headset today? Like, what would you say they should go check out? Um, if you're over sixteen or or eighteen, yeah, uh, I would say go play accounting. Accounting. That is one of my favorite experiences ever. Okay. Uh, it was made by Justin Roiland, who created Rick and Morty. Yeah. I th- and a company called Crow Crow Crows. Let me see if I can. And it's hilarious. It doesn't sound like it would be fun, but because of who made it, I bu- I know that it is. It, it's it's basically um. It's a puzzle solving game. That is just gruesome and horrific and hilarious. I think and I've, I think I've been through this before. It's it's pretty weird. Just full I, disclosure. <laughs> I, <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. Uh, so this, um, yeah, Squash it, Tendo. Uh, I would say Alt Space is one of my favorite experiences. High Fidelity is another really good experience if you're into you know custom creating things. Uh, I would say. Beat Saber is the closest thing we have to the killer app. Mm-hmm. I think that's like one of the most popular uh, VR experiences that I've I've seen. Right, just because of the the ability to play any song, and it's just got really good um, replayability value to it. Uh, well, they're like set packs, and then there's like an entire modification community that uh-huh, where makes they make it, their own. Yeah. This so, is very similar to Dance Dance Revolution, where there's set packs, but then people, there's a whole community of people who make their own charts to any song. Is there really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, same I, thing. You're going to have to let me play your uh, Dance Dance Revolution machine before I. Oh, off. sure. <laughs> sure. That'd be cool. Do you got the butterfly song? Um, Yes, like. I'm pretty sure I had the butterfly song. <laughs> <laughs> it's on there. Yeah. So, like, uh, the anime girl that we're looking at right now, that is not part of the standard game. That is a mod. <laughs> oh, okay. Is it? She's VTubing. They are VTubing, yeah. VTubing. Man, the hair dynamics on it are amazing, though. Look at this guy. He's a, uh, he's this, a, per, this person is definitely using Liv. <laughs> What's that? Uh, Live is a, um, it's basically a green screen platform for, that was made specifically for Beat Saber. Okay. To basically put people inside of the level. Wow. That's amazing. So Beat Saber, um, I think another game that I was reading about that's really popular that I haven't had a chance to play is the the Half-Life experience. Oh, Alex. Alex, yeah. I, I've been I, wanting I to check that Alex. out. I love Alex. It's it's so much fun. Yeah. I was so when I was at uh SIF, um, if you asked a question during the Steam panel, Valve would actually give you a family and friends card. And I didn't realize it, but when you enter it into your account, it gives you all of their games for life. Oh, cool. So anytime that Valve comes out with like a Team Fortress or a Half Life game, I now get it for free. Oh, so you have this in your library. Yeah, it just showed up one day. I was like, what? Nice. Right? It's so, fun. It's also kind of horrifying to play it inside of uh, a VR, VR world. Because you're, like, moving dead bodies, and you're, like, trying to get aliens off your face. and Oh, Jesus. You're you're talking with people who are, like, mutated. and it's it's a lot of fun though like you can move things with your mind basically with these gravity gauntlets i think a lot of people were really bummed out about this game because there was such a demand for half-life 3 for over a decade and then when they finally came out with it 
It was VR only. It was VR only, and, a lot, and you know, it's great for the people who have VR headsets, but then, you know, if you didn't have it, then it's kind of like you didn't... A lot of people who probably would have loved to experience Half-Life 3 or Half-Life Alex still haven't because of that. And I just... I think that gets into a question about, like, when can we make sure that VR is more accessible for everyone? Um, but hopefully... You know, as the cost continues to come down and it'll get, become more accessible. I think another thing that was making it less accessible for people is that you needed like a really fancy, expensive computer to run everything. And now mm -hmm. it's like a lot of the headsets are all inclusive and they're becoming wireless. You don't need to have wires everywhere and a big space. And I think it's just the a lot of the obstacles are starting to disappear, right? Yeah, and, you know, we're just going to continuously get better and better headsets as it evolves. Yeah. So, um, if you were trying to, if you're trying to sell somebody on getting a VR headset uh, that ha doesn't have one, like, how, what would your, your, your pitch be for um, why you should have one? I would ask them what they need it for. Yeah. Like, like what, what are your interests? Mm -hmm. And if they go, Hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm a multilinguist for school. I love learning new languages. Uh, it's part of my education. How will VR benefit me for instance? Mm -hmm. And with that, I would say, well, if you learn a language in VR, you'll learn it 30% faster. Wow. Why yeah. is that? Uh, so you have this part of the brain called the hippocampus, and it's responsible for taking your short-term memory and converting it into long-term memory. And what they found out is inside of that part of the brain, you have what are called GPS cells. And your GPS cells are your evolutionary response to being able to find your way back to your tribe or your cave or your house or your hut, whatever. So like when you leave your house, they fire off when you get to the edge of the block. They fire off when you get to work. They fire off so you can find your way home back at the end of the day, right? Well, um, this university uh, did a study with mice, and they put this mouse in a maze, and they put another one in a digital version of the exact same maze when they were researching GPS cells. And what they found out was GPS cells inside the virtual environment will fire off more frequently and randomly mm. because as humans, we're not used to being inside of digital environments yet. We haven't evolved to that point, right? So basically um, with, with that research being done, what they found out is you're going to retain information inside of virtual reality a lot more than in the real world. That's why people will be like, I remember everything I did inside of VR, but I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. Hmm. It's so the, the experience is a lot stickier. It sticks to your, sticks to your brain. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to, you know, train people, VR is the way to do it. Also say you're a, uh, a manufacturing for computer parts, you mm -hmm. know, train people inside of VR and they'll, you know, be less likely to, you know, mess up in the long run and they won't damage the components yeah, that, I, that you might, you know, run into. Yeah. I read that it's, it's good for developing motor muscle memory and it also provides like a safe environment where you can fail over and over again without any repercussions. So like these are definitely valuable use cases for VR, right? Yeah. Uh, it's also great if you have, say, like uh, PTSD. So one of the um, first things I did when I tried to enter the VR industry is I volunteered for CIFX, which to me back in the day was, hey, it's going to be a bunch of really cool video games mm -hmm. and, you know, whatever else at this event. I'm going to go volunteer. I'm going to get to go try them and I'll help people get into those experiences. And when I got there... It was six very distinct experiences by immersive journalist Nani De La Pena, who is this immersive journalist. She'd been a journalist for about 20 years. And then once the technology became available, she started working on these very social enlightening um, experiences. So like there was an experience where you put on not just the headset, but a rumble pack. 
and you were a small child in Syria and the U.S. drops bombs on your village. And you can feel what basically how the ground shakes in your like chest. Like what they would experience yeah. when that happened. There was a domestic abuse experience where the audio was from a real 911 call. So what you're hearing was actually happening to somebody. Mm-hmm. It was terrifying. Yeah. Uh, you were There was a 360 video experience where you were a woman going to Planned Parenthood for an abortion. I've done this one. Have you? Yes, I did this one. And I remember thinking I would have never had an experience in my life where I would have gotten to know what it's like for a woman to have to deal with like the, the protesters outside of the right. Planned Parenthood place or dealing with like the the awkward conversation with the doctor. Like this is something like as a man I'd never experienced, but it's like I'm developing so much empathy for women who do have to go through this. It's like these, these VR experiences there, they have the, a lot of power to be able to create empathy for someone who would have never developed that empathy. One of the big takeaways from when I was at the event was I would get these very like bros would come in and they would be like, oh, VR games is so amazing. And then, you know, what's up, dude? And then they'd go through the experiences. And then they'd be like, women are people, too. I need to call my mom. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I mean, so those experiences are incredibly powerful. I don't recommend doing all of them one after another. Yeah. Because it will mess with you and just break you down. Emotionally you, draining. Yeah. You need time to like recover after, mm-hmm. you know, doing that. But going through those pro- going through those experiences I think are great because it's putting yourself in someone else's shoes. It's raising your empathy level to what else is out there and it's probably helping change your worldview for the better. Yeah. I think that maybe that's one of the biggest misconceptions about VR. It's it's not just for video games. It's for experiences, which is kind of like a catch-all term for, like, you know, uh, it could be a lot of things, you know? Yeah. Right. I think that's maybe something that requires more education in society for people to understand that, you know, you these headsets can be ways to experience what it's like to be someone else. Yeah. And and that can – it's in some ways, that is – better than a game it's it's so funny to me because the longest time there was all this research that suggested that video games made you angry and violent and yeah you know video games might piss you off every once in a while but it's not going to cause you to go out and like kill somebody there was actually several studies done where people who were were more likely to like commit school shootings actually play less video games Mm. than the average person so interesting so is the implication being that maybe if they had an outlet maybe it wouldn't have happened yeah that's the uh correlation that it points to hmm yeah that just goes to show you that like a lot of people who take a a public stance on like you know violent video games cause violence they are basing it just off of their like baseless opinion it's 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 not based on their their predisposition to whatever the narrative is that they're trying to push yeah yeah usually we get things that are based off of like religion Mm -hmm. that probably shouldn't be (laughs) based on religion yeah um welcome to america (laughs) uh (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's a thing uh like I like I don't want to talk politics on your uh yeah on your show, but I I feel like we can do better, man. <laughs> yeah, for real. So uh pivoting for a second, you used to be a social media creative director, and so you know, you know a decent amount about social media, making things go viral and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And you call yourself a social media futurist, and I was wanting to know why. Um well no, I mean, I understand it. I think that you're very forward thinking and you're always looking to see like what's the new you're you're very you're ahead of the curve in everything. So it mm-hmm. makes sense that you would want to use that title. But um, I'm interested in like what you think the future of social media is as a social media future is. Uh, I so it's my job to basically look at the current trends and kind of estimate where we're going. And then basically help educate everybody on how to get to the next evolution of social media, which 
for us would be, say, the metaverse, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's also my job to take a look at different social media cycles. So, like, um, one of the big cycles we tend to look at is the uh, newcomer strategy, which is, say, everybody's using MySpace, right? And then it ages out a little. And then everybody is like, oh, yeah, you know, my, my dad uses MySpace. I'm going to use Facebook, mm -hmm. right? And then it ages out a little. And then the next generation comes in. It was like, yeah, you know, my grandma uses Facebook. Yeah. So I'm going to use Instagram. Or, or right? TikTok or something. Or, yeah. yeah. So, like, TikTok is just the next step away from, say, Instagram, even though a lot of people are using it. Yeah. So every generation... They pick something new. It evolves a little bit more down the road. Mm -hmm. And basically what's going to happen is new companies are going to show up. They'll either hit critical mass or they'll die out. And the ones that die out will usually either go bankrupt or they'll get bought out by some other company. And that's exactly what happened with Vine and Twitter. And then Vine went away. And it was like, okay, so where do we get our short form me media, right? Musically became a thing, right? It had a lot of followers. Um, Musically couldn't keep up monetarily. And then so ByteDance bought them and converted all their users to TikTokers. Oh, right? I didn't so, know that. Yeah, so there's this ever evolving landscape in social media. And basically, it's my job to, as a public speaker and an educator, and a content creator myself to basically go, hey, this is where everybody should probably go because I see a lot of potential. And my guess is as great as everybody's because, you know, it's a free market, right? But, you know, let's try to get a timeline on things. Let's try to make sure that nobody's sticking with a single social media platform mm -hmm. because, you know, if you put all your ba your eggs into one basket, say like Viners did, you know, Vine goes away, you lose your entire following, and the people that survived are the ones that migrated to, say, Facebook and YouTube. Mm -hmm. What about people who use Twitch, though? My understanding is, that aren't they under some kind of, like, contract where they're not allowed to share things, share their stream or something? I don't know. Like, like Restream.io, I was looking into that, and I think someone was saying that, like, if you're on Twitch, you're not supposed to share in real time your stream to other, pl like, they try to tell you you have to stream only here. I don't know if they enforce it, though. I'm not sure. I'm, I don't think they enforce it okay. at all. Okay. Uh, I I do know that your stream is downloadable, mm. and then you can chop it up and put it onto other platforms, which is what you should be doing anyway. I see. Um, on my on my website, um, I have a free ebook called Get Serious About Social Media on um, hightechinfluencer.com. And you don't need to use uh, an email to download it, not yet. Um, we're going to make that a thing very soon. Um, but basically, that ebook shows you how to take one piece of content, split it up, and then put it across everything else social media-wise. So... Basically, how that works is you do a show like this, right? And you might take the video and you might place it onto um, IGTV. And you might place it onto... Man, my mask is falling apart on me. <laughs> it's making my nose super itchy. Uh, so you might take that video. You might put it onto Facebook. You might yeah. put it onto IGTV. You might clip it out and put it onto TikTok and Instagram. And it, make sure you take the post and you put it into a Medium article with all your show notes for that you took. So, like, at, you know, minute 43, we talked about this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. uh, here are all the links. You know, you take that. You put it into a Medium article, you copy it, you put it into Tumblr, and you copy that, and you put it into LinkedIn because it's uh, a business, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, related to people who might want to grow their social media marketing on, you know, LinkedIn. So so just not putting all your eggs in one basket is really important. To, Absolutely. Yeah. You, you want to be everywhere 
anywhere forever. 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 <laughs> so, um, so when you say back to the original question of like the future of social media is that it's ever evolving and that each newer generation wants to deviate from the older generations and have their own thing. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any other, uh, uh, talking points that you'd like to make around, uh, like what you've seen off into the distance of what's um, going to happen. I like one of the things that I've been seeing is like, it hasn't Facebook been trying to like make an aspect of Facebook, a virtual reality experience. Yeah. That's, I've, that's horizons. Yeah. So I, I've seen some examples and, of that. Do you think you now need a, a Facebook login to use the Oculus, which so a lot of people we, are pissed about. Right? A lot of people are pissed about that. Yeah. But so, I mean, I can't say, I mean, after Zuckerberg bought them, it's, it, can you really be surprised? Of course, everyone could know that's what's going to happen. Yeah. But so it's, you know, just, it's the name of the game. They're trying to, you know, take everything, put it into one place to be like a universal marketplace for, mm -hmm. for Facebook's whole thing is they don't, they want to be the internet. They want to be the be all end all everything. And they don't want other people to like migrate off their sites. Okay. That's why if you put a link inside of Facebook, it's w less likely to get seen than just a native post. Yeah. Like a, like a YouTube link, they'll punish you for it. Absolutely. Yeah. And that makes sense. That's a really good, you know, business strategy for them. It's not great for the creator, which they should be taking into account, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So I don't know. Look Zuck, at Zuck's look, gonna look, Zuck. look, look, <laughs> Yeah. Jeez. Suck. So look at cycles. You know, look to the metaverse. You know, I think 360 videos are going to be more of an increased thing as the technology gets better. Because 360 mm -hmm. cameras, if they're, you're not doing it in, say, like uh, a game engine or a 3D program, they look really blurry mm -hmm. all the time. So we need better quality 360 cameras before those take off. Mm. And I actually posed a, a question to one of the YouTube groups I was in. I was like, so what's preventing you guys from doing 360 video? And somebody went, nobody watches them. They're annoying and I hate them. Oh my and God. I was like, dude, I got over 10 million views off of it. What's your channel? <laughs> I checked it. He was at like 1,200. Yeah. I'm like, man, I... I don't know. I don't know how it's no how where all these views are coming if nobody's watching it. Yeah, I mean, he probably needs to work on one of those four things you were talking about. Oh, you know, probably. Right? Yeah, Pro probably the marketing. I think marketing is where most people need help because it's just maybe they just don't know where to put it and who to connect it with the the content they've created, or maybe it's the content itself. I don't know. I mean, it's it's easy. Just mixture. create a an extra Twitter account that's relatable to your main account, and yeah. start sending your link out to different news outlets trying to get it to get them to cover it yeah but i think i think some people just don't even understand like they're not thinking that way and you are obviously <laughs> more people need to think that way that's that 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 these that um the media is accessible to to help them spread a message that you can use them and they can use you kind of thing i guess yeah um but uh, I don't know. I've run out of questions. I mean, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk oh, to me. My pleasure. I, I love educating. So, yeah, I, I I feel like I've learned a lot and seen a lot of really cool experiences that you've gotten to work on. I know that you said that uh, if people want to connect with you, they can follow you on Twitter at uh, Cap and Design mm -hmm. at Cap and Design. That's correct. And uh, is there any anything else you'd like um, to leave our our viewers with? I mean, I'm I'm free to come and speak to uh like schools college campuses uh businesses about you know marketing the future of social media uh, i have a speaker website called hightechinfluencer.com if you need services for xr content creation or animation i have my company studio capin uh great team of people i love working with everybody and we've done a lot of really cool creative things Yep, that's my my amazing team. There Topher is. Welsh, Audrey Lane. I, I know Hamilton. Topher's a great guy. I know him. Cool. All right. All right. Well, 
Thanks for being on the show. Um, I'd shake your hand, but COVID, so. We're gonna... You want to you do an elbow? Ebola elbow. Oh, well, uh, there, sure, it's close sure. enough. All right. All right. Later, everyone. Bye, guys. <laughs>